Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to the Royal Society of Medicine and our series of In Conversations. Now then, a lot of you have been following us loyally for oh, months now and will know uh, the format that we use and I assume you like it because you've come back. But others will have joined especially for today and I just need to emphasize what I've done repeatedly throughout our series. This is a conversation with interesting people with interesting things to say. The RSM is a charity is neither political nor in the business of creating controversy. This is not Newsnight, and I am not Emily Makeless. I wish I was, but I'm not. And it's certainly not the bare pit of question time. So if you come for that, you're going to be disappointed. Now, I know that people who agree to go into arenas such as question time, which includes my guests tonight, are always described as guests, but then treated as anything but. Here, a guest means what it says. And I'm delighted that my guest today is Shami Chakrabarti, barrister, prominent campaigner for human rights, person who did more than anyone else to, anyone else to establish the reputation of liberty, a campaigning group for those human rights, author of the Chakrabarti Report, Labour Shadow Attorney General from 2016 to early this year, and a member of the House of Lords where she sits as Baroness Chakrabarti of Czech Kennington. And the title gives away the fact that she lives around the corner from me, but as ever in these COVID conscious days, she joins me on Zoom. So Shami, welcome and thanks for joining us. And I do hope that the next time we do this, it will not be on Zoom. Okay, so Shami, um, I, I think you know, we want to get to the, to the, to the nitty gritty fairly quickly, but I do want to just conduct us a little bit through a couple of the overtures. And uh, you are, you are uh, Northwest London born and bred. Um, and like all of us, uh, strongly influenced by, by your parents. But if we could just start with a story that I know you've told before, but I don't think many of the people joining today will have heard before um, about you know, one of the formative experiences you mentioned with your father and, and which kind of set you on your way uh, that would, uh, as they say these days. Oh, I think you're talking about the Yorkshire Ripper story. Yes, sorry, sorry, I thought, and, uh, that's I'd tell you about um, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. God, what, 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 does, what does Simon the psychiatrist want to <laughs> ask me about my father? My goodness, it's <laughs> like, like, the story that I think you're referring to um, is something that I've described as um, a, a, a formative moment, mm. um, in a way, quite a politically formative moment. And um, I was an adolescent in the in the eighties, um, which some of your young colleagues will consider the um, Jurassic period in, um, in, in recent history. But um, I think it was an adult, I was a sort of pre-adolescent. I, I, I might have been about, about 12-ish, I think, when um, the hunt was on for the Yorkshire Ripper. This is something that, you're, that the people of our age who are watching will, will perhaps remember. Um, it was on the news um, every night um, very anxious making, um, this um, rapist murderer was uh, reaping havoc in, 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 in the north of England and with primitive, primitive um, images and, um, you know, it was, it was, it was analogue TV, not digital. We would have these reports of the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper every night, night after night on TV. It was a strange experience as a sort of 12 year old girl to be watching those reports with my parents who at that stage I probably wasn't even discussing sex with let alone um, sexual violence and murder of, of, of sex workers in, in Yorkshire and it was very uncomfortable and yet when you're that age you want to be grown up and you're sitting on the sofa with your parents watching the news um, and I think one night I said um, in the presence of my parents that um, this was clearly some kind of monster, animal, whatever, and when the authorities caught him, they should do X, Y, Z to him. And my late father, he's, he's, you know, um, who, who died a couple of years ago, he turned to me and said, you can't possibly say that you're supporting the death penalty. And, um, and you know, he was speaking to me like a, like the adult that I was not. And my parents often did that, to, 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 to be fair. Um, and so he challenged me on the death penalty. And in truth, I didn't have an opinion about the death penalty at that point. And 
I, um, to my shame, um, responded with, well, why not? I mean, for somebody like that. And sadly, this is an argument that, that still goes on in the world today, in China, in the U United States, but even sometimes in British politics. And I said, why not for a monster like that? My father said, you cannot possibly support the death penalty. You have to understand that no justice system in world history or that man could imagine or create, no justice system will ever be perfect. And you need to think about what it would feel like to be someone accused of a terrible, terrible crime. And you've been through a Rolls Royce criminal justice system, you've been found guilty, um, every appeal is exhausted and that's it. And nobody believes you and even your own family don't believe you. This is quite a hard thing for a 12 year old girl to hear from her dad. Um, and you are now taking your final steps to the electric chair or the lethal injection. And if, if you believe in God, you say, why are these people about to kill me? And that is what my father said to me when I was about 12 years old. And it feels as powerful today when I'm whatever I am, 51, as it did then. And that was the moment that I kind of discovered something uh, that I couldn't call human rights then, but I call human rights now. That's a good beginning. And I think the other influence you've also written about in, in a lecture you gave that I, when we were chatting earlier, I said I found entrancing uh, in 2015, but you also said the other way you went into law, it was reading that led me into the law. And you singled out one or two books that, which you said, if you had not read at an early age, you would have had a different career. Do you want to uh, just- You mean, uh, to, just, you mean to Yes, kill I know, I'm going to have to tell you these things. Again, words, yes. and, sorry, it's a killer mockingbird yeah. and, you know, it's perhaps a cliche for a lawyer of my generation to, to you know, to, to cite To Kill a Mockingbird as a really formative favourite book. Um, but I do because it was, and that was the truth of my experience. It was a, it was a, um, it was an O level text. So O levels are another thing that marks one out as belonging in the Jurassic period because it wasn't, yes. even, a GC, it wasn't even a GCSE. Um, and there are now lots of doctors. I hope there are lots of doctors on this Zoom because there it's are. really. It's, it's really out of um, solidarity and, and respect for doctors that I'm, that I'm here, um, the, the new superheroes in, in white coats. But, um, but we lawyers of my generation, many of us were moved by that book. But on reflection and in this moment, I have to also confess that it wasn't just the book, it was the English teacher. And my, <laughs> and, and my English teacher um, was an extraordinary um, young teacher um, just 10 years older than me, called Mary Bowsted, who is now um, not just an extraordinary English teacher, but a really important um, public figure in the current crisis. And of course, the, the, the co-general secretary of, of one of our, you know, one of, of, the, of the biggest teaching unions. Oh, right. I didn't know that at all. That's, that's really interesting to learn. Now, I don't, I'd say we want to move on to, to, uh, uh, other stuff very quickly. So I'm going to skate over. Uh, you were at the LSC, you read law, you were called to the bar, you were at 39 Essex Street, and then you joined the Home Office um, pretty, pretty young, I think, and you were in the government legal service and you spent six years there, um, which you've, had, you've actually written about quite affectionately, to be honest, uh, despite the fact you, you do often satirize Home Office, but you, said, you actually said you enjoyed your time there yeah. and you met some great colleagues. Very, very much, Simon. I, I, um, it was the, the most formative um, part of my career. I learnt um, more law there than possibly anywhere else. Um, I, um, I met some amazing colleagues and, and made some incredible friends. And I think of that often now in a context where uh, the civil service is being um, denigrated and at attacked by by some by the current government and um, I'm, I'm sorry to but you know I was a I was a lawyer first and then I was a civil servant and it's another profession so that it was my second profession but it, it's still one that I feel um, very loyal to mm. um, 
people who would serve governments of whatever stripe without fear or favor people who didn't um people sometimes who had excellent degrees and, and 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 brilliant brains who could have done all sorts of things who could have chosen you know um money in the city or power or celebrity but they chose public service and it's an it's a really important profession i think it's a really important um institution of of independent um governance and and absolutely i i um i'm incredibly grateful to to lots of mentors including lawyers that i that i worked with in that time yeah, I think that's what we're saying. They at the moment have a lifespan equivalent of a kind of subaltern on the Western Front, don't they, poor things. But anyway, so you then, you, you, I think you said that, however, Mandarin wasn't your mother tongue. And then, you know, then, then uh, you, you leave and you're going to you join the, the organization Liberty, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more. And you join it on September the 10th, 2001. And I have this image of you arriving at work on the next day, and how well you tell us what happened on the next day and how your life changes well it was it was it was a really extraordinary time um of obviously and and again it sort of dates it dates people middle-aged people um because younger people <laughs> yes. i mean it really does you know, so when i was a kid people used to talk grown-ups used to talk about where they were when kennedy was shot right mm. and nowadays we'd go Please God, Helena Kennedy's not been shot right, by some. <laughs> please, please God, no. Um, um, so, but, but I think probably again for my generation, and and yours, Simon. You know, nine eleven was an extraordinary event, and and um, in in the span of history, I'm not convinced that centuries. Um, really begin at the at the moment in the Gregorian calendar when their timetable to begin. That would be a Zoom call beginning, but but actually centuries sometimes begin slightly off piste. And I think that that maybe the 21st century began on 9-11. Um, and, and, it, and it was extraordinary time. I had left the home office and my fight that the, the last um, brief that I had in, in, in the government legal service was actually advising on, on terrorism law. And I went to work for the um, human rights organization, Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties. Uh, I was um, given the, the, the post of general counsel and I was asked to revamp and sort out strategic test case litigation and to be proactive and to think about what the priorities in human rights campaigning and test case litigation should be for the next few years. So there was what 24 hours of blue sky thinking and then and then the next day there were no there were no more blue skies. Um, and so it wasn't really about blue sky thinking, it was about um, responding sadly to um, to the in my view, incredibly ill-advised responses from from um, Washington and Westminster, um, the 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 Bush and Blair administrations, um, and their um, prosecution of the so-called war on terror. Okay, I'm just let's let's again set out the landscape here for a couple of things. So, you you played a major role over the next few years in protecting liberties during this so-called war on terror, but. And obviously you made, uh, you didn't always make friends during that, as you well know, and there were familiar things, charges that, that were hurled at you. And I just want to just raise two with you because I think what, you know, your response to this is very important. And the first one um, is that um, it was often said, and this is around all sorts of things that happened at that time, that uh, the innocent have nothing to fear uh, from identity cards or detention or whatever. So if you've done nothing, you shouldn't be worried about all this. Now that, that sounds quite appealing, doesn't it? So nothing to hide, nothing to fear. Yeah, is the, it is the kind of um, sentiment, and and we still have it to, to some extent. It, it sort of like you know um, this kind of liberal stroke libertarian authoritarian um, axis is is a really interesting one that seems to cross cross politics. 
so left right party politics is essentially for the most part about tax and spend and to what extent it, it really about economic equality whereas there's this, a different axis in politics that is um, an instinct um, that, that's the more liberal stroke um, author, authoritarian axis um, you know and and you know somebody you know one of your previous interviewees and I ought to be ought to be closer um, on that axis than I sometimes feel um, but um, clearly privacy matters and privacy is not the same as secrecy and people don't have things to hide but they have things to protect um, and and yes of course sometimes privacy and free speech for example are intention and yet sometimes they sometimes they walk hand in hand and and privacy is something that we need to grant to whistleblowers and privacy is something that um that chadwick boseman the you know the the great um black panther um oh, right. movie right. actor who Thank who you. died chose to chose to to hold dear in relation to his cancer even as he worked stoically and died that wasn't secrecy that wasn't criminality that was choosing to keep his his, his medical information and his health status private so that he could carry on being the person that he was in the world there are all sorts of reasons why people want an intimate life a private life that, that don't mean that they are that they are criminals or terrorists so. In, indeed and, and doctors know that doctors know that better than anyone of course because of the sacred trust that that your members and and, and and your profession have with patients that just doesn't work if people can't trust their doctor anymore and sometimes that will be that they don't want the doctor to wrap them into the police that you know mm -hmm. this is the knife wound or the bullet wound that i i gained because i was you know in a place i shouldn't have been but sometimes it's you know it it's you know it's all sorts of information that maybe out of embarrassment maybe out of loyalty whatever the reason how could how can you be a doctor taking care of patients if it if, if there is no medical confidentiality and and these principles apply elsewhere in life too and the courts of course vigorously defend this um but um after 2001 both courts and parliament did not seem to be vigorously defending other uh, fundamental rights such as not to be detained without a trial or not to be detained for indefinite lengths of time etc etc and first of all why do you think that happened and, and second how, how did you put together a kind of coalition that would eventually end those practices well in the end i think the courts stood up very well um parliament less so in truth if, if we're talking about something like detention without trial yeah um, the, the, the late great Tom Bingham uh -huh. and his and his brother his you know his brother judges delivered brother and sister judges delivered in in in, in the Belmarsh case which is probably one of the two most significant um, constitutional law cases that I've been involved in, in in my life the first is the Belmarsh case the second is Miller too. In, in which I was a party and intervener, which of course was was about Boris Johnson's yeah. illegal prorogation of Parliament. But in the you know in the Belmarsh case, I think we saw Tom Bingham um, at his absolute exquisite best, an, an extraordinary person, one of the most extraordinary people that I've ever had the privilege of meeting. And I know I know because you mentioned it to me that you've read his his his, his book, The Rule of Law. My son gave it me. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? What, yeah, aren't, I you, it. <laughs> aren't you lucky in your Aren't you lucky in your son? <laughs> True. Um, aren't you lucky in your son? Um, an extraordinary book, and I'll never forget Tom Bingham inviting me to lunch at the Athenaeum, of all places. Um, I think by that time they might have even taken women as, as members and not just get, as guests. But he invited me to the Athenaeum for lunch and he wanted to chat with me and I kind of had that feeling of oh my goodness what have I done that um and and actually he took me to lunch just to ask me if I would chair a, um 
an event for him and interview him rather as you're interviewing me now but in person um, to talk about his book the rule of law because he was passionate about the rule of law as not being the province of lawyers but something that needed to be shared with 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 the wider population because it was just too precious and he was looking forward to a retirement full of campaigning to save the human rights act he was passionate about that too and, and, and unfortunately the greatest jurist probably of my of my um of my lifetime was you know was taken um by cancer too soon mm. You received uh, one of the few standing ovations at your conference, I believe, at uh, Liberty, when you spoke on that. Crucially, um, what he established, I think, in that Belmarsh judgment was mm. that the, the key to the human rights kingdom um, is equality. When, you know, whenever I speak to lay audiences about human rights, I say, what's your favourite human right? What's the most important human right of all? It's a really good game to play, particularly in, in secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, and depending on what kind of school it is, you know, the hands go up um, or people shout out with, with whatever degree of enthusiasm or, or regularity. But people will say torture or free speech. And I'm going, mm, yeah, really important, great human rights. But what's the most important human right of all? And in my view, um, Tom Bingham established in that in that seminal case. A and others, it's called, that the most important, powerful animator of human rights is equal treatment or non-discrimination. So we lawyers call it equal treatment, non-discrimination, but in human speak, we call it empathy. And why <laughs> it's more powerful even than torture or the rule against torture or the rule in favour of free speech is if we really practised it in life, there would be no torture and there would be no censorship because we would treat other people as we would like to be treated ourselves. We would walk in other people's shoes, Atticus Finch, to kill a mockingbird. Uh, you take the point. I do. And we're going to come back to that as we go on to the, to the era of COVID. And, and so during your time at Liberty, I, I think it's just worth mentioning that you, as well as being called the most hated person in Britain by the sun, which I think you probably wore as a badge of honour, to be honest, but you also became, uh, uh, you know, you, you received, you're the first person we've interviewed whose portrait is the National Portrait Gallery. You had a string of awards, chance of universities, God knows how many honorary degrees you got, I don't know. And you, you would become a household name. And then in 2015, you decided that uh, you'd been saying for long enough, it was time to move on. And you, and, and you decided that you would, that was you tell the civil service magazine. Well, why did you think it was time to move on? Oh, I think it was probably, past time to move on um, because <laughs> yes <laughs> in, tr in, tr in yeah. truth like you know if mm. if one is going to reflect on a career and um i think that you know you have your dream job you have the you know you have a dream job that you you love but if you really want to do your duty you have to understand that nobody should lead an organization for too long um, and you know because you become stale or you be, you know and with a with an with a campaigning NGO in particular, the challenge is that, however brilliant or articulate or passionate or whatever you you think you are, some people are just not going to like you. Some people are just going to go, not that bloody woman again. Um, and and some of those people might actually be potentially sympathetic to the cause or the ideas. And sometimes they need a change of you know a change of voice, a change of face. And, and when you don't have a lot of money for paid advertising, the, um, the, the principal spokesperson of an organization becomes almost like a human logo or a human brand. And so the way to change that, you know, change up, refresh that brand is, it, it, is to have a new person. But more specifically, I think that I realized um, by that point that, um, so many of the um, the human rights challenges of the moment and subsequent moments were going to be heavily internet technology related and i was late to that I, I was not quite young enough in my view i was of a different generation you know i was a pre i was you know we've already dated me simon um i was the pre-internet 
generation. <laughs> um, I never went on Twitter. I had no interest in going on Twitter. I, um, and some of the younger colleagues that I saw coming up really were drilling into that stuff and had a expertise and interest in doing that. And it was really time both in campaigning terms and campaigning tools and in human rights analysis mm. to really pass that baton on to, you know, to the next generation. Okay. And then in 2016, you, you take a different turn, obviously. And, and I just do need to say, you've already, we've already discussed the importance of confidentiality, which the health professionals have. I would just remind the audience that uh, you, you as a barrister have the same issues as well. And, there are things that you can and you can't say, just sort of things that, um, because of legal cases and indeed uh, the forthcoming report from the Quality and Human Rights Commission, we thought it'd be last month, but unfortunately it's been delayed. And, and, and I've agreed with you to, to respect that. Um, but I do still want to ask you a couple of questions about this period that I know people, uh, I think, would want, would, would want to ask. Um, now, uh, about the, the report that bears your name, the Czech Republic report, and there's no dispute as to why you were asked to write it. It was in response to two incidents of uh, uh, anti-Semitic comments made by two senior people in, in the Labour Party. But what I want to ask you about is the choice that you then made, um, which was you, to whether, whether the report would be on anti-Semitism in particular, which had been the starting point, or on all forms of racism. And you, you chose the latter. And I just wonder, looking back now, 2020, did you think that was the right choice? Absolutely. Absolutely. 2020, the, the summer of Black Lives Matter. Um, and it was absolutely the, um, the right choice. Why? Well, philosophically, I think that one of the worst things about racism and, and really bad racism, as opposed to some of the ignorant, lighter touch racism, but, but, but the worst systematic racisms in human history are about creating hierarchies of race and therefore philosophically I believe passionately that you don't respond to that creation of hierarchies of race by buying that narrative. Um, more um, practically in the, in the context that I was asked to, 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 to look at it, I think that some of the problems that the Labour Party um, was facing and perhaps other parties too related to its disciplinary mechanisms. And clearly they have to apply even handedly to, to, to all racism, to some extent to, to all heinous behavior, but to all racism. So you can't have um, the Chakrabarti recommendations on um, disciplining anti-Semites that are distinct, for example, from disciplining um, Islamophobes or um, anti anti black racists, but I think even more practically than all of that, um, I had seen left racism before, and I've seen all forms of I've seen lots of forms of racism in my life and in my in my own experience, as I try to mention in in, in the report itself, mm -hmm. which I know you've read, Simon. Uh -huh. But one of the particular um, problems that, that I experienced. I was an undergraduate at the LSE. I, you know, I've been, I, I've witnessed um, the, the, the left strain of anti-Semitism for a long time. One of the particular dangers on the left is of thinking that your class-based analysis of racism means that racism is only racism or bad racism if it's white against black and rich against poor and that somehow a brick through a window in in tower hamlets is worse than a i don't know a brick through a window in hampstead garden suburb um and not seeing anti-semitism as proper racism and therefore calling yourself a lifelong anti-racist um and you know being on the right side of all sorts of other anti-racist struggles but not seeing um not seeing contemporary anti-semitism and i think if you're going to to confront that and in an educational 
as as well as a forensic way in in a political party with all the challenges that that brings and still brings it's mm. important to place anti-semitism where it belongs in a broader context of um of of believing in equality and believing that all human lives matter okay and and then so you you the, the report is written as, as you've just said and, and i think um I, I don't think anyone could say the launch went as, as as you would have expected it to can you just just say what kind of from your perspective did go wrong i think it's sort of well established now i was i was heckled by a particular person who um who, who claimed that I wasn't taking questions from, as it happens, from black people, even though I had all, already taken a question from a black journalist. So I called on um, this abusive man um, and he then laid into, um, he laid into a Jewish MP um, and was just behaved really badly and appallingly. And that was the last thing that you, needed at the launch of a of a report that you wanted people to in, engage with seriously and, and with humility and yeah it was it was terrible yeah okay and and you know unfortunately unfortunately you know things it, it, the report things didn't finish there did they and just no. the last question really on this and then we will move on but it's just that Looking back now, and 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 why do think things went worse? I think that's fair mm -hmm. to say. What, what, in, in, in as much as you can say, and I know that I know that you, you have restrictions. Uh, what what can you say about why you think it didn't go? Mm -hmm. The only real restriction is that part of the what happened next and is is completely in the province of the of, of the EHRC. Yes, and I, I, I really I want. I want I to. That. And I really want to defer to the commission because it's a it's a body that I I I, I believe in and it, and it should be given its you know its its proper respect and head. But from my perspective, I think that um, there are a number of civil wars that 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 were contributed to this particular problem at this particular moment in the Labour Party. Um, one is um, in Israel, Palestine, and even in, in modern Israel, where I think even in recent days, there have been lots of people, um, in, in, including young Jewish people, protesting against the, against the government of Israel. So it's a, Indeed. You know, it's a very, very contested um, part of the world that doesn't and, and, and we are all interconnected so there's no troubled part of the world that is in isolation. Mm -hmm. The second civil war uh, to some extent there, I found in my in my inquiry that there are some real sores and issues within British Jewry itself. Um, it, it's, I, I learned as a, a young Asian girl that, that no um, community is a monolith and that you know that there's there's a trauma there that is sometimes um, used by some parts of the community against others and it, it, in a very harsh way. Um, but the biggest civil war um, that I had to to try and grapple with and that can continue for some time was a civil war in the Labour Party the hyper-factional atmosphere in the Labour Party that led some people to deny the existence of anti-Semitism out of, in my view, their, their misplaced idea of what loyalty to, to the then leadership was, to, you know, ridiculous things said by people who ought to know better about never having witnessed any anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and it all being made up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Really people that ought to have known better doing it because of a, a factional motive and other people, I'm really equally sorry to say, um, both not doing their disciplinary duties properly and weaponizing the issue. And in that hyper-factional atmosphere, you cannot deal with it, you know, with the, with the 
the problem itself. And so I'm afraid that that was to that, that hyperfactional civil war, which perhaps is not yet resolved, but maybe will be resolved, that hyperfactional civil war between factions of the Labour Party um, worked to the detriment of you know, young Jewish members of the Labour Party in particular, but also um, of you know, the wider electorate, the community, um, and you know, they deserved better. Thank you. And I think we'll leave it there and return to the, well, that you did return to the present, but I mean, the next and the final issue that um, we want to talk about now is COVID. And um, from, from the perspective, your, your perspective um, in your record of human rights, etc. So first of all, how do you think, well, do you, you kick off really, how, how do you think uh, this is going at the moment? So you, do you think we've got everything right? We haven't got everything right. I, yeah. I want to be fair, even to a government that I um, have huge problems with. This is um, a terror. This is a global pandemic. There are no easy answers. It was never going to be easy. And there are a lot of people um, doing their best in good faith in extraordinarily difficult times. However, I am of the view that um, such government interventions as have been made have um, often been too little, too late, and um, wrongly targeted, and a lot of incredibly vulnerable people, not least in the NHS, have been sorely, sorely let down. And I, you know, I feel terrible about that. Um, I, I, I was involved in cross-party discussions at the, at, at the beginning of the crisis. Um, I was worried then about the lack of government preparedness and um, for a pandemic which or, which was on, you know, the risk, the government risk register for, for many years. I was, I was worried in the meetings that I was privy to um, in, in March, and I'm even more worried now. And I think that um, some of it is just chaos and, um, you know, pe people who want to permanently campaign rather than properly take on the responsibilities of government and partly it's ideological um, you know the, the sorts of people um, who say save the economy let the elderly shield themselves and save the economy I, I so disagree with that view what is an economy what is this abstract thing called an economy if it's not a way of looking after people there is no economy in a graveyard okay so so I'm interested in a, a worldview that prioritizes people and peace and planet over if, if effectively um, very wealthy people getting richer, airlines profiteering whilst anxious Britons can't get home, um, you know, um, and, and, and people running unsafe um, working environments, whether warehouses or building sites, so that a, so that a new generation of working poor gets sent back to the, the, you know, the equivalent of the trenches and mills and, 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 and mines of, of the 21st century, um, for, really for, for reasons of greed, not, not reasons of, of, of public good. Okay, I mean, I, I will try and come back to that, but, but what I want to put you we, we've discussed these issues as well with other people that have come, have come to panel this, but I want to put it back into the framework of, of human rights, really, and you mm. as an authority on that. And uh, with liberty, you're at the forefront of the argument that national security should never compromise human rights. But what about national health? Are there times when, and, and there clearly are times at the moment, this is what is happening, our quest for health is compromising human rights, um, liberty, are making comments about this now how far do you think we are entitled to go and at what point do we have to start making trade-offs here between rights health and, and i'm afraid the economy as well which is also part of health absolutely so so I, I i don't see human rights as divisible so you're quite right that that, 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 that when i was um the director of liberty you know, the principal focus was in civil and political rights, civil liberties. Mm -hmm. But, but I, 
I'm not just a civil libertarian. I'm certainly not a libertarian uh, or a right-wing libertarian. I'm not even purely a civil libertarian. I believe in human rights and human rights in the, um, you know, international human rights as agreed on after World War II are social and economic and cultural as well as civil and political. And we do not, you know, sacrifice um, the lives of vulnerable NHS workers, whether they're hospital cleaners or Asian doctors or anywhere else. Send, we, don't send, we shouldn't be sending them to the front line of infection in bin bags whilst certain people get to um, get the right to roam with their Land Rovers and their Labradors. Um, maybe even some people that you have interviewed recently. I find that attitude to the economy, this abstract thing, I find it, I find it absolutely obscene. And to go back to the late, great Tom Bingham, uh, the greatest jurist of, of my lifetime, the key to the human rights kingdom is this principle of equal treatment. All lives matter, um, not just princes and judges and nights all lives matter and if that means that we need to make interventions and if that means that there needs to be a little bit of this redistribution of wealth and power in order to safeguard the vulnerable then so be it and just as it wasn't right to incarcerate without charge or trial muslims and foreign nationals during the war on terror it is not right now to say that the elderly can shield themselves and the poor people on zero hours contracts can go back to put themselves in harm's way so that um so that privileged people like you and me simon can mm -hmm. live our lives uh, unencumbered uh, your reference prison, prison, princes judges and knights i think people who've been following this series will pick up uh, from the Jonathan Sumption's uh, history of the Hundred Years' War, in fact, it's, and uh, and that princes, judges, and knights were uh, m did far better during a time of pandemic. I say that as a baroness, of course. Yes. Um, so there you so there you go. The jokes on the jokes on me, Simon. But you take you 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 take my point about yes, I you, do. Know, you know Madonna from her bubble bath in her penthouse said that it's a great leveler. It's not a great leveler, is it? It really no. isn't. It COVID has exposed and amplified every social and economic and health injustice on the planet and we cannot tackle it properly without addressing those injustices too in my in my view but 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 your previous uh, you know, uh organization liberty has had some critical things to say about uh restrictions on human rights has been some of them uh obviously some are are essential but they've said that some of them are not and they've already introduced the concept of at what point do we think that this has become a disproportionate reaction to the threat in which we haven't and this is the language i use in the mental health review you know, are, are are you sure that we are using the least restrictive options for the least well that's a very appropriate response and we need to be forensic about the assessment of each interference um, in personal liberty in a, in a really forensic way but you know what Simon one of my biggest objections to for example the coronavirus legislation mm. and I was involved I think I mentioned in cross-party talks about that legislation in drop. One of my biggest concerns is not, I mean, it's chilling stuff. Let's be clear about it. That, you know, the, the, the power to shut down mass gatherings, the power to allow people to be sectioned by one doctor, not two, to interfere with burial. It, it goes on, it goes on. This is worse than anything we saw in World War II. It, it, so, it so, yes, it's chilling, but my biggest objection is not that any of these particular measures you know might or might not be disproportionate because clearly context is everything here but my biggest concern about the legislation was its asymmetric nature so it's asymmetric authoritarianism in that lots of powers to you know break up the picnics and the raves on the beaches fair enough in a certain context but where were for example the powers 
to requisition manufacturing plant so that PPE could have been churned out and we don't send your colleagues out to work in bin bags? Where were the powers to requisition private testing? Um, I, I have friends, I'm sure you do, who were able to get, who were able to get tests in a heartbeat online if they paid enough money whilst social care workers and elderly people in homes did not get access to, to, to testing kits and the lack of and, and one of the scandals and there will be an inquiry I, oh, yeah. I they, when the inquiry comes that that deficit in 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 testing and tracing and isolating i believe will be one of the one of the big scandals uh, you know, alongside the, the way that the elderly were were um which would were treated in this pandemic so if you're going to intervene as you have to in a, a quasi war situation and by the way i quibbled with the war on terror metaphor mm -hmm. back in the early noughties but i don't actually quibble with a, with a quasi war metaphor for, um, for for COVID, because I think that the scale of the casualties, um, and the uh, and the way in which we are to some extent all in it together, or should be, you know, does does conjure the kind of wartime spirit and losing loved ones in such great numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know. I hate to say this, but we'll probably hit a million deaths before the end of the year in the in the world. And Britain has already lost, you know, more than half the you know, the the entire number of civilian casualties of World War II. So I do think the war metaphors yes, are, are are relevant. So if you're gonna do the war metaphor in order to, you know, get people united and we'll meet again. Let's have war type requisitioning powers for, for plant and supply chain and PPE and, and testing and tracing, not just the breaking up the, the parties um, or, or on the beaches and elsewhere. <laughs> I didn't expect you to say that actually, because uh, quite a few, I usually do ask about the war metaphor and quite a few particularly those who've been to war or, uh, or historians of it, uh, don't, don't like that metaphor, but I've not heard it defended as vigorously as that, actually, but um, good, good for you. Well, I'm, I'm, well, <laughs> well, well thank you. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't been to war. I've not written about war yet, and I've not been to war, but I... It's I a metaphor. I, we, we, we accept that. It's a, it, it's a metaphor that's used by, by governments um, periodically throughout the ages, and usually... Um, probably always it is something to be wary of because the reason why governments use war metaphors is because um we're all a bit less critical and a little bit less harsh in it of government of the powerful in a war type situation and 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 i guess i am a bit too but i don't ironically i take the view that in an emergency it's time to be super um vigilant not 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 less vigilant yeah uh, this that that's more what I was expecting, but because you in the past, you know, during the war on terror, we're going to call it, you know, you, you know, and right about how easy it is for governments, even with the good intentions that they usually start with, mm. um, but will end up rising roughshod over people's rights and yes. uh, and and that's why it's really important that I mean, I, 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 that there are some organisations. Um, you mentioned my, you know, my alma mater, but also mm -hmm. Big Brother. Big Brother Watch is, a, is another organisation that has been right up there dealing um, on, a, on a daily basis with disproportionate exercise of, of, the poli of police powers. And, and of, often, I think, it's been, it's been the cock up rather than, um, rather than the conspiracy. And of course, there are still problems of, the, of racism in policing and, and enforcement. And I, I don't think it's a complete um, coincidence, let alone a mistake. And historians will write about this in the future when there's, when there's space to, for it to be history and not current affairs. Oh, yeah, but the coincidence indeed. of the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and this pandemic, given how ultimately people of, of some races are, are suffering the most, is, is, is significant, is, is really really significant i think but but what i say is if you as a government take the view that this is an extraordinary situation the pandemic re requires intervention 
let's try and be a little bit more even handed about that intervention. If we're taking police powers to break up picnics and prayer meetings and weddings and whatever it is, where are the equivalent powers and resources to properly inspect the warehouses and the building sites? Because the health and safety executive apparently do not have um, sufficient resource to do that. Now, um, I've been watching the, the questions uh, as you've been talking, and I have to be honest, somewhat to my surprise, the, the, the topic that's emerged most, uh, and I have been watching, I've now just managed to switch it off by mistake, so I can't name the people who've been asking this, but at least four or five people have also asked about judicial reviews, hmm. and that's in the news. Um, Lord Fox is going to be leading on an independent review we learned a few days ago about the scope, scope of judicial reviews because uh, our government and indeed one of our previous guests um, but believes that, that this may have got out of control. So the, the question, and, and government is also losing a lot of judicial reviews, which isn't new by the way, you, you managed to win quite a few against uh, uh, Jack Straw when he was Home Secretary. But well, the question I want to ask you is this then, building on, on, on the ones that flash past, is this evidence that the judiciary is out of control or that the government is out of control? The latter. Um, I'm, 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 look, I'm com authoritarians of both persuasions don't like judicial review. Um, Jack Straw, David Blunkett, Tony Blair, you know, they didn't like judicial review. They didn't mm -hmm. like the judges calling them out on forcing asylum seekers into destitution or locking people up without charge or trial. So, you know, so this is not, I want to be even handed about this and not partisan about this. Mm -hmm. And now we've got, in my humble opinion, a far right government that is um, really, um, that has grudges against the judiciary about things like Windrush and, and in particular um, Miller to the illegal suspension of Parliament. And Miller to is a classic example of the judiciary um, upholding the, um, the one principle of our unwritten constitution. The, if, there is a, if there is a operating principle of our unwritten constitution is parliamentary sovereignty. The executive did a smash and grab and shut down parliament and the judges said no. And they were, it was completely predictable in my view. I wrote a legal opinion. It was published in the Guardian. I had no hesitation. I said, absolutely. I took, you know, a, a less um, on the fence view um, to other people. I said, I have no hesitation in advising and I you know, advised that, you know, the former late Labour leadership that the courts would strike down that illegal suspension of Parliament and in due course they did. I was vindicated and I think we've got a grudge match going on at the moment um, because judges are you know an independent institution a bit like the civil service though it's you know it's harder for civil servants obviously to, to be independent and it's also red meat for um, a Trumpian far right wing and it's not, and what's horrible about it is it doesn't follow in any of the great political traditions of our country. And, you know, I'm new enough to politics to, to retain my respect for all of the great traditions, even the ones I disagree with. This policy, <laughs> this policy is neither liberal nor conservative, let alone progressive. It smacks of the F word, Simon. And I don't mean the Anglo-Saxon one. And to be fair to our previous guest, that he would have agreed with you uh, and, and did say that, it, that he said both Miller one and two were uncontroversial, actually as points of law, that they were, they, they, they were uncontroversial. Um, so I think, I mean, that leads to two, we're, we're running slightly out of time, but I think that leads to two lines. Around. One is, is how I'm quite sure that you are, uh, you are, uh, um, it's not worth asking about, uh, do you defend traditional independence? Because that's just a stupid question. Um, but I, I want to... But I Lint, do. I, I really, I, really I, do. I, I know you. No, no institution is perfect, okay? When I was an undergraduate at the LSC, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the book that we all carried around was, the, you know, John Griffiths, The Politics of the Judiciary. And mm -hmm. I read about, 
you know, the ways in which a previous generation of judges had, had interfered with, you know, progressive and left-wing municipal government, etc., etc. And of course, we must have judicial diversity. I passionately believe, um, again, in, in, um, in difference with one of your previous discursants, I passionately believe that we need to do better in judicial diversity, both on um, on um, on black and non-white people yeah. and on women in of course we need to do all of that but at the end of the day this is the rule of law and it comes before it you cannot have democracy or even human rights without this more basic principle that it that is the rule of law and it, when governments come for the judges you are not going to have democracy for, for very long and indeed, that's happening in some other countries, of course. But uh, clearly, you, you you wouldn't be in favour of kind of parliamentary. Uh, well, I'm asking actually this, uh, but I don't hear you arguing for you know parliament to to take over the appointment of judges as no. has been. No, I think that'd be a really. I think that'd be a really really bad idea. <laughs> yes, I, so do I. Actually, so do I. You might as well appoint doctors. Should we have Should we have parliament appointing uh, appointing doctors? Doctor, this kind of anti-expert thing has been really interesting, hasn't it? Oh, so no, in the no, 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 you're Brexit, getting really silly. <laughs> we're having a go, we were having a go at experts, but the minute yeah. politicians are in trouble, right, whether it's they've got a political scandal, so they need to, you know, something like, um, you know, like a burning tower block, <laughs> an icon of, of, of greed and injustice, what do we do? We set up a... A, a judicial inquiry. So we hate legal aid and we hate lawyers, but when we're in proper political trouble, we call in the lawyers and we have an inquiry. And, and similarly, we have the COVID crisis. What do we do? We don't send ministers out unless they're flanked by expert scientists <laughs> and medics. So, you know, I'm sure the ironies of all of that won't be lost on your... On, on your, on your no, and, and they won't be on, on the people uh, watching and listening as well. And that leads me to the last point that I do want to also very, very uh, topical, but uh, um, the, I think it's Perm Sec, Perm Sec at the Home Office a couple of days ago had to backtrack um, from complaining about activist lawyers, and, and uh, which he clearly didn't mean in, in a friendly way. But um, I just want you then to, you, you, you obviously are an activist lawyer in, in many respects. Um, and I just want to say, do you think, is there something wrong with being an activist lawyer? Is it a bad thing or is it a mark of honor? But also just to reflect on, but can it also go too far? <laughs> um, so can, um, is it, um, uh, well, I am an activist, I am a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed act, activist lawyer, but you know, what about those lawyers that, um, that defend um, the big banks and help them avoid help them avoid regulation what about the the lawyers that 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 help super wealthy people not pay tax are they any less activist i wonder what about the, the lawyers that go into court to defend the home office when it um when it's deporting people in the in, in in the wind rush scandal is that any less activist a language you know George Orwell, the politics of the English language is um, important to, to lawyers and I would argue quite important to doctors as well. And if anyone yes. hasn't read Rachel Clark's Dear Life, it was one of my favourite reads of, um, of the lockdown and I, I, I highly recommend it. Well, that, that brings me then to, to that. So a lovely way for me to do my kind of quick announcements. So I'm going to give you the last word, but Rachel Clark will be one of our guests later on in this year. Um, in this series, so I will be interviewing I shall her. Watch, I shall watch that. Yeah, she's br I mean, she is brilliant, isn't she? Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so I need to just remind everyone that these In Conversations are brought to you free of charge by the Royal Society of Medicine, but they're not free of cost. And like every institution that relies on teaching, training, and bringing professionals together to learn and enjoy, we are up against the wall. So do please, uh, if you'd like to make a donation, it's very clear how you can do uh, from, from the website and from indeed from, from the link on this. Now, tomorrow um, 
we do our, our lunchtime uh, uh, seminar, uh, webinar for, for uh, health professionals, so most of the people aren't health professionals who really enjoy them. And at uh, 12.30 tomorrow, it couldn't be more topical if we tried, and tried we did. It's uh, back to school, infection, risk, and mental health. And we've got Russell Viner, the president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, one of our favorites, and Amanda Spielman, the head of Ofsted. And we have a professional in the chair, and last I hear you cry, uh, Victoria McDonald from Channel 4. And then next week uh, for this series, say we'll have a new presenter, Dr. Henrietta Bowden-Jones, well-known, I think, to many of you, particularly in my trade. And she'll be interviewing the yachtsman, Tracy Edwards, so we will stand for even more choppy waters than are usual just for us. Now, Shami, thank you so much for doing this, and I think you showed once again why a mutual friend of ours described you as one of the great campaigners. Um, and, and this meant very much in, in, a, in a very positive way and why, uh, you know, the, the fires in you are still there and, and come out so well. And it's really good of you to spare your time. Uh, you certainly didn't have to do this uh, and it is very much appreciated. But, but I want though to leave the last word to you because I think a lot of people are interested in this and say, what, what, what is next for you? Uh, you know, what, what's next for you, Shami Chakrabarti, Baroness Chakrabarti, however we call you, what's next? I think some more activism, uh, some, some more writing and some more activism, I think. There's, um, there's plenty of injustice to go around, for sure. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you're not going to be out of a job, are you? <laughs> no, okay. So, Shami, once again, thanks very much. Thanks for everyone for listening. I hope you got as much out of it as this as, as I have. And, uh, and, and thanks for spending the time. And uh, good night to you. Good night to all of us. Thanks. Thanks.